I should. Let me double check, though, because he's actually are missing a couple of slides that I want. Yeah. Doing everything on here takes so long, though. So I'll try to be quick. Yeah. How's everybody doing today, by the way? Happy Valentine's Day. I forgot it was Valentine's Day until I got here. My wife's in uh, Colorado right now. So... We usually do our Valentine's Day like six months past Valentine's Day to avoid chaos, which I don't think we're the only ones that do that, but. All right, can everybody access the slides now? Good? Yeah, awesome. That's what I wanted to make sure. So how was the first exam? Okay-ish, I hope. Okay, good deal. You guys actually did much better than last semester's first exam, so that's good. We're improving. Our exam has been more honed. I like it. I want to discuss it just a little bit really quick. Um, so exam one, this was kind of the breakdown. Uh, initially, you can't see that very well, but the high was a 94. Uh, the low score is a 48. The mean score is a 72, which in universities, statistically, they tell you 70 is what you should expect as a perfect average. Um, so 72, so you guys are slightly above that. Standard deviation of 14.25, which is pretty common for this exam. Um, average time to take the exam was 29 minutes. And Cronbach's alpha, I don't know if you guys know what that is, but I think it's an interesting statistic to understand. Uh, basically, what Cronbach says is how uh, reliable your questions are. So like, if I asked you all, if I was going to measure how angry you were, no, how much you liked your job. That's a very common one. So like, how much do you enjoy your work? I might ask you like on a survey, uh, do you enjoy your job on a scale of one to 10? Um, do you like coming to work on a scale of one to 10? Are you satisfied with your job on a scale of one to 10? And we would expect people would rate within like one point on all those. It'd be like a six, a seven and a six, right? And then Cronbach's alpha would tell us the higher the value, the more all those items are related. But if I had a weird question in there, like, do you like ice cream? That would like skew the scale weirdly. And then we would, our Cronbach's alpha would be low. You typically aim, 0. 0.7 is like perfect. Like you want point, well, technically one's perfect, but you aim for 0. 0.7 or above in most sciences. Uh, so what that number tells us is it's above 0. 0.7. That would say that all of the questions accurately represent this set of chapters, so chapter one through seven. So all the questions are actually assessing what they say they assess. Uh, which is a measure that I look at because if that number is super low, that means that some of the questions might measure what we want, but other questions don't. So I could have a student like ace a lot of questions and then do really bad on other questions. And it's like consistent, like everybody's getting these questions right and these questions wrong, which would indicate it's not measuring what we think. So that was good. However, one thing that was not good was there was this one question that popped up. Now, not everybody got this question, but like as soon as I saw it, oh, you can't see it very well because the screen. The question is, which of the following is a way to think about management? Now, according to the exam, the correct answer is the art of getting things done through people, which is not wrong. But I'm getting my PhD in this field. And as soon as I saw this, I said, no, it's not. It's the art of efficiency and effectiveness, which is what 93% of you said which was marked as wrong. And then this morning, another professor texted me and said, I don't like this question. I thought it was, I thought it was C. And I was like, yeah, it is C. Uh, I think the book has like a throwaway deal and whoever wrote this question was like, it's more this. All of us disagree and say it's more that. So everybody got, not just the people that did this, everybody got two points added. See, that's a bad question. Um, my general rule is like, if I miss it, how can I expect someone else to get it? Like, so we're not, we're not doing it. So everybody got plus two. There was a couple of other questions that didn't perform perfectly. Um, we did have like a 45% success rate, which is slightly low, uh, but they were, they were good questions. They were just hard. Um, but a lot of people that didn't see that question, you get the points anyway. So the average is actually a 70, uh, 74. And now the low is a 50 and the high is a 96. Anybody have any questions? 
Was anything shocking on the exam? The second most uh, missed question was a question asking about the trade blocks. I have a slide on them, but I know if you didn't focus on them, it was probably a hard question. Um, I did throw away during that lecture, I was like, you're going to be asked on these, but we're not going to go through each of them individually. So that, that was a hard question if you hadn't read them. But some people just knew them because like, it's knowledge you see in the news. Cool? Great. Horror story, the first time I ever gave an exam, this exam, um, was the only time I've had a bad exam experience. And uh, this is supposed to pull from a pool of like, I think 75 questions. And originally it was supposed to pull, pull from a pool of uh, 175 questions. However, it accidentally, whoever set up the exam, didn't set it up to pull correctly. And it pulled from a test bank of over a thousand, including questions from other chapters. Uh, only like a few questions from other chapters, so it wasn't that bad. So it didn't completely butcher the exam, but like there was a lot of questions on there that like I had physically gone through and said, this question sucks, we're not gonna do it. I ended up throwing out like nine questions and it was like a 15% curve. Also, I've made some dumb young professor mistakes, but that one was actually out of my hands entirely and I still had to be like, sorry, but that didn't happen today. I was so panicky inside that it was gonna happen. I don't know why I have anxiety about that, but cool. All right, well, good job. All the exams are more or less the same as far as that goes. Um, I think the first exam is actually the hardest one for a lot of people because it's so much information. Uh, the other exams have a lot of information, but they're more pointed, I believe. Uh, the final is probably the hardest exam technically because it's accumulation of everything. But if you did good on this one, it's a pretty good indication that you'll do well in the future. That tends to be the trend. Exam scores tend to go up over the semester. So today, last week, if I got to completely control everything, I would actually combine chapter five and six because I think planning and strategic management are so similar. And we see a lot of combining of certain chapters. Um, but today we're going to talk more about strategic management. It's going to have a lot of overlap with the last lecture. Uh, this lecture is broken up into two parts. So today we're going to talk about kind of brand overall strategy, and then we're going to do a SWOT analysis, and then... Um, Instead of doing Viro, which is like the next part of this chapter, we're going to wait and do that Wednesday, right? Uh, we actually have more material probably to cover Wednesday, but this is still solid. And the extra slides I was going to pull up still aren't pulling up, so I'm doing it all off memory. Which isn't good. I have a bad memory. Also, I've been up since 4 a.m. Jael got her, went off on her flight at 4.20, and she was supposed to, her friends were supposed to pick her up at 4 o'clock. They got there 20 minutes late and also Gile didn't wake up to her an alarm. So not only did they pull up in a panic of like, I'm sorry, we're 25 minutes late, but Gile was like literally in bed. And so that was stressful. And then we have like a two acre long driveway and then she like screams out of the car window, I forgot my contacts. And so I'm like standing there in just like shorts and socks. And I ran inside and got her contacts and I sprinted across our yard in the middle of the night and handed it to her. And then when I got back in the house, I was like, well, now I'm awake. So that's what I've been doing. So strategy last week we talked about these like grand strategies that are set at the top level all the way down to these micro strategies that you're doing uh within your organization and these like uh, more like assembly line do we really refer to these as corporate level business level and functional level now your corporate level strategy is more of your big mission statement your big value statement stuff like that your big vision statement um this is like your entire organization. What's, why does your organization exist? Where is it going? This should all sound kind of familiar. Now, a business level strategy can focus more on particular products, um, particular subsections. So if we talk about like Disney, Disney has a big corporate strategy. They have a big vision, a big value statement. I believe their value statement is something like, to get out of my notes, something like family and friends and bringing people together and the magic of whatever. And their mission statement is essentially we want to spread, you know, family friendly entertainment to everybody, which is actually funny because they own like a billion companies that also aren't friendly, friend, are family friendly, but whatever. So that's their big corporate level strategy. Now, business level strategy might be looking at 
their amusement parks. So like they have a very special sector and very special strategies just for their amusement parks. The amusement park is part of this big corporate strategy to spread this family message of entertainment. However, we can't expect for an amusement park to operate with the, all the exact same strategies as like their movies that they make or like all their merchandise that they sell, right? So all of these businesses are part of the big organization strategy, but there has to be a business level strategy within each of these. Now, if we get even fall, smaller down to like a functional level strategy, we may look at things like the HR department within each of these things that's dealing with like the immediate employees within your park or selling your merchandise in your retail stores or whatever. Disney stuff is expensive, man. Woo. And they are really, really good at preventing knockoffs. Disney's like a terrifying corporation. They're like so friendly, family friendly, but like in the business world, the more you study them, they're like ruthless. They're like super good at maintaining like their logos there. They'll sue you right away. They'll shut you down. It's incredible. Like you don't see knockoff Disney anything because they are quick. South Park makes fun of them all the time. But they're so accurate. I don't watch a lot of South Park, but every time they talk about Disney, it's like spot on. They always portray it as like this evil mouse. That being said, I watched Encanto for the ninth time this weekend. It's fantastic. Great movie. I cry every time there's just one scene, me and Jaya, I'm an emotional guy. The sign where the grandma is talking about like losing her husband. And it's in Spanish. So I don't even understand what the song says. It doesn't matter. So before we go on more and we talk, because uh, on Wednesday, it, it sucks because I have to talk about Porter today. And then on Wednesday, we're going to talk about Porter's Five Forces, which is what he's really known for. But we're going to introduce him now. Everybody should probably know who this is if you're in business anyway. If you're in my field of study, like research and theory in business, you have to know who he is. This is Michael Porter. He's a Harvard professor, I believe, currently still. He's in his 80s. Um, but last time I checked, he hasn't retired. I just checked on Twitter the other day. He's 170,000 followers on Twitter, which is impressive. There's a basketball player named Michael Porter also, and he comes up first. This guy does right here. That's amazing. So Michael Porter has uh, written either a chapter or an entire book. He's had 90 chapters slash books. He also has 130 publications, which is freaking nuts. The head of our department here is a very established researcher, has like 14. Uh, he wrote a famous book called, or not a book, he wrote a famous article called how competitive forces shape strategy in 1979 and that pretty much established him as like the number one our business researcher ever uh, he develops a lot of strategy theories um and this book or this uh, article that he wrote established porter's five forces and porter's five forces is used by pretty much every company every fortune 500 company ever still today like he will live in infamy or not infamy he will live famously <laughs> for the creation of this theory uh we'll talk about it on wednesday more but essentially he said you can measure these five things in a company or in an organization um, and its industry, and you can tell how competitive that industry is. So like you can tell how hard it is to get into the automotive industry or into selling coffee or whatever, uh, based on his theory. And he wrote it in the seventies and it still holds today. We still use it. It's great. So he's an important person of a long list of old white guys that sat around thinking a lot about stuff. I plan to be an old white guy that sits around and thinks about stuff. So, but he also importantly established strategic positioning. Now, strategic positioning. Oh, good. I did put that there. Developed by Michael Porter. It is the idea that organizations have to, have to position themselves in a way that they have some sort of sustainable competitive advantage. Because we live in a capitalistic society, most or our industries operate in all around the world operate in some sort of capitalistic society. And the idea that you have competition, like open competition, so barring the government preventing this open competition, you have to do something better than somebody else to succeed. When this doesn't happen, you get things like insulin, which is extremely expensive because it's like completely regulated and patented, and only three companies can produce it. And to do this, you need to do something better than somebody else and then protect that position. And that is purely strategic positioning. Every company has to do it. 
in Michael Porter's words, you have to perform different activities from your rivals or perform similar activities, but in different ways. A lot of Porter's work is all about your rivals. It's all about like how to meet the people around you and how much competition there is going to be around you. Excuse me. So I had Professor Zabinski last year help me come up with these three examples. And she, these are all companies she knows well, and I don't at all. So last time I did these examples, someone had helped explain to me exactly who they are. Um, I try to know them better now. But the three creepins are key principles and underlying strategic positioning. So you have to create some sort of unique and valuable position. It's not enough to be unique. I love on Shark Tank when people come in and are like, we do this. This one lady created like a plate that had like a rubber bowl and they were all connected. And she's like, you could put it in the microwave and you could put food in it. And if, if it spills, it spills on the rubber mat and then it won't be hot because you can pick it up and pull it out, right? By like, so it's a literally a plat, like a rubber plate with a rubber bowl and it suctions down. You can grab the whole thing and pick it up and pull it out. I was like, that is unique and not valuable at all. Like that's gonna be a pain to put in the dishwasher because you gotta put bowls upside down, you know, and plates usually like straight up and down. That doesn't make any sense. Also, I don't want a rubber bowl when I fold it up because like what if it spills? And it was very unique, but for some reason in my mind, I'm always like, ah, that is unique and not valuable at all. Every time I see that thing. She didn't get a deal. But you can create this in a few ways. So you could serve a few needs, but to many customers. Now, ironically, Anna Zabinski's uh, example of this is actually a pretty common one, which is Crocs. I don't own Crocs. I wore them once and they're fantastic, but they basically make shoes, but a lot of people buy them. You can also support broad needs. So make lots of products for a few customers. This is a cut place I've never heard of, so I did this example, just Bye Bye Baby. Do you guys know what Bye Bye Baby is? Really? Everybody always knows what Bye Bye Baby is. It's like a baby store, right? You go in there, yeah. So they really only work, you know, infants are only can only use their product for the first like year and then during pregnancy. So it's a very select group of people buying from them, but they sell everything related to this process. Really? Never been in there. We bought everything through Amazon. So that's how we did our baby. <laughs> and then we stupidly gave it all away. So if we have a third kid, ah, do it all again. You can also uh, have people with broad needs and have many customers. Now, sometimes that seems like the, oh, that should be the obvious winner, but that's difficult to supply broad needs to lots of people. Uh, there's a billion companies we could use. Expedia, they provide like your hotel services, you can rent cars through them, you know, book flights, all this kind of stuff. They, they do a lot of things now. They're very uh, multifaceted. Now, strategy does require trade-offs in competing. To date, there are few, if maybe zero companies that are able to basically dominate in every single way. You see it happen occasionally. And what I mean by dominate in every single way is they're unique, they're very valuable, they have, uh, they're cheap, right, and they're high quality. Typically that only happens very minute circumstances and uh, typically through things like massive technology innovation where you have some sort of innovative technology that nobody else has that you create and all of a sudden, I can create this much cheaper than you and it's significantly better. If you look at uh, the example I love to give of Best Buy and Netflix, it's kind of what happened there. It's much cheaper to deliver products streaming wise because there's no physical delivery. I don't have to have a truck driver. I don't have to have the actual physical material. I don't have to keep up with it. Um, it's easier to monitor your uh, materials through digital. Like as long as you're connected to the internet, I know you have it and you're not pirating it and then I can take it away from you at this date. Um, and they, they can do it cheaper and it's better. It's better for the customer. That is very minute moment in which it's like, ah, oh, they're doing everything better than you. But typically you have to choose. 
you know, Coach Purse isn't in the process of making cheap goods for everybody. That's not what they're selling, right? Other companies are. Dollar General kills it. They still kill it. And they're not trying to sell quality products. They're trying to sell cheap products. By the way, can you all hear me okay with this mask? I've never taught in this mask before. Okay. I take pride in projecting because I hate when I can't hear a professor. But I like went through mask and made my wife stand across the room and project to her till be like, okay, those are the ones. And I bought a thousand of them. And then finally, and I bolded it because it's very important. Strategy involves creating a fit among all of your activities. Now, what I mean by that, Apple makes a million products, right? They make a lot of things. What allows Apple to be so successful at what they do, or Microsoft to be so successful at what they do, is they can pull from their core competencies and what they've done well with other products and you know, even like some businesses from their company to create their other things. So you have a MacBook and MacBook is you know, great and it's got this certain software and you can do everything with the MacBook. Then they made the iPhone. That is a different product. It's serving a different market. It has a different purpose and there is a ton of overlap. Right? A ton of overlap. Software development, how you manufacture them, right? They even integrate together. Uh, but Apple essentially is pulling from these core competencies. They're not just going off the left field and making something completely out of the blue. Microsoft's actually more known for being really branching. At one point, they almost made a, uh, started making movies. You guys didn't know? They were forced, Microsoft was forced at one point to like cut back because they gave too big. Um, there's a cool case study on Microsoft about like, would Apple exist if the government had stepped in and prevented Microsoft from being what they could have been? Uh, Microsoft was getting very, very large. And what they did is they started off as just essentially software and moved into hardware and they kept moving up and they were pulling core competencies from one sector to the next. And it kept getting bigger until your first product and your last product are completely different. However, Throughout it, it's gradual, so they're just kind of building on themselves. And they were actually about to start going into the movie industry uh, because they have a video game called Halo, and the company that was going to make a Halo movie pulled out, and Microsoft goes, ah, we'll just make it ourselves. And then the government was like, you're too big. And they made a break up. But it is important to have some sort of fit between all of your activities because otherwise... You can't sell cheap products here and then expensive, high quality products here because if you don't have, if you can't use the same overhead, if you can't use the same material, the same strategies, the same knowledge, uh, then you're essentially running two businesses twice the cost. So let's talk about one of my favorite sad stories, Hastings. Do you guys know what Hastings is? No, it was a South thing. It was like, in Oklahoma, I think Kansas a little bit, and a lot in Texas. I think it started in Texas. So they were in like a few states. Uh, they were essentially blockbuster originally. They rented movies and video games, of like hard copies. And they kind of suffered for what happened to Best Buy. Now, the difference was uh, wherever Hastings was, it would usually be dominant. So like Stillwater used to have a Hastings, and the blockbuster there couldn't keep up. And like this is when blockbuster was actually rolling, uh, like doing really well. And so Hastings ended up beating out Blockbuster and Stillwater. They're typically massive stores. They were very, very big. It was like going into like a Walmart. It was a large building. It'd have tons of movies, tons of games, uh, and also some like little side stuff. Now, when Hastings started getting big, they started expanding. Now, they kind of got hit on two fronts. So Hastings starts getting bigger, and they start expanding their products and services. And at the same time, as they start expanding because they're getting big, then everything started going digital and Blockbuster started suffering. So now like what Hastings did really well originally is also being attacked. So they got panicky and they really started spreading and choosing lots of different businesses. So for example, Hastings started off renting movies, video games. They started off with just movies and they went to video games. Then they also started carrying like indie titles, like more smaller films. And that was kind of cool. And that made sense. It broke off their core competencies. We get it. Then they started also selling books. And that was a little weird, but they added on the store in Stillwater and then a lot of their stores and they had like a whole section where they sold books. It worked because Barnes and Noble is really the only big competition and they could be very selective about where they did this. So they sold books. 
They also started opening up a coffee shop and they said, ah, oh, we're going to have this thing. It was actually called Hardback Cafe. I love the Hard Rock, but Hardback Cafe. And it would be in all their Hastings stores and they would sell coffee. And it was just as expensive as Starbucks and it wasn't that good. And then they started selling candy and stuff like that, which is kind of like what you see Best Buy did. Like, okay, we're going to sell candy, but we're going to sell a lot. Like, not just like a couple, like, convenience store. We're going to sell, like, walls of candy. And then they started selling vinyl, like, records for some reason. Like, this is, like, in, like, 2010. They started selling, like, vinyl records and this, like, warrior, weird, like, indie music stuff. And then they started selling a bunch of graphic T-shirts. And they had, like, all these, like, T-shirts and clothing and all this stuff. And then they started selling skateboards for some reason. And they had like a whole skateboard and longboard section. And then they also started selling like airsoft guns. That's an airsoft gun. That is not a real gun. They started selling airsoft guns and BB guns. And then they started selling a bunch of weird gag gifts, like odd things like whoopee cushions and like these like inflatable beer pong tables and all this odd stuff. And then they started selling things like Pokemon cards and trading cards and all this kind of stuff. And then they started selling even weirder gag gifts that you find like in the deepest receptions of Amazon. And then they started selling sex toys for some reason. And this was all in Hastings that started off as a video store. Like one building. This isn't like multiple like organizations. This is all under this building. Because what they saw was like, oh, we have this massive building renting videos. We should capitalize that and create, you know, sell books and sell this, sell this. And then now our video section is not doing well. So they're like tearing it down and just putting new organizations, like new products in that don't fit with anything else. And then when you went to Hastings, you're like, I don't know what I'm here for. Um, they didn't do anything better than anybody else. Everything was kind of expensive because they weren't getting these products cheap because they're not buying them in mass because they're not selling a ton of airsoft guns or anything. Everything they sold, you could buy cheaper somewhere else. And it was weird. Like who's buying sex toys at the place where people are like buying books? and like renting video games. It was weird. It was so sad. I loved that store growing up. The point being, their strategies did not fit. They did not maintain any sort of competitive advantage. They went in multiple different directions and that was it. Pacing closed, they're dead. I don't think there's any of them left. Not like Blockbuster that has one location in Oregon. I think Hastings is completely gone now. Look them up though. They're pretty cool for a while. Excuse me. Thank you. I believe I talked about this last week on Monday. Yes, before the exam. So this is the general strategic manic process. Again, at the beginning, you establish your missions, vision, and value statement. This is to kind of create the tone for what the rest of your organization is going to do. Hastings should have had a very strong missions and vision statement. And then they should have pushed that because I doubt that everything they were selling really fit into that vision statement. Uh, instead, they went 18 different directions. Then you assess the current reality, which it is true. Hastings needed to assess what was going on. They needed to pivot in some way, much like Blockbuster. Uh, I will say it would be much harder for Hastings to pivot than Blockbuster because they did not have the resources Blockbuster did. If Blockbuster was going to live, this isn't my like opinion, the general consensus is they should have beat Netflix to the market on like digital streaming because they had the money to do it. Um, but it's hard to know where everything's going to go. I mean, at one point, someone said that touch phones would never work because people like buttons. So then formulate whatever your strategy actually is, execute that strategy, and then maintain control of your strategy, evaluate it, and then go back and decide, do we need to reach our change our mission and value statement? Again, if Hastings follows this process perfectly, which everything's hindsight 2020, then as they go through this process, pretty soon they would have said, we are getting a downturn. The market is moving away. We need to see what we really are trying to do as a company, change what we need to here, and then figure out how we can execute that and then slowly transition. This should be reviewed from last week a little bit, but our mission statement, what is our purpose of being here? Why did we create the organization at all? Where do we want to go? And then our values, what do we stand for? At the end of class, last time I talked about organizational fit and how you want to make sure you hire employees. 
uh, whose values fit your organizations. That's very important. Don't forget that. I'm sure there'll be a question on the exam about it. If you're lucky. It's only thing weird about saying that. It's like you might like half of you will get that question, half of you won't. Now we're gonna go through these in more detail and then I'm gonna give you guys a couple of mission and value statements and then see if you can guess the company. I do have to pull them up to make sure I have them exactly right, but I think I do. So your mission statement should answer essentially these questions. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I want you to have them. Who are our customers? What are our major products or services? In what area do we compete? What is our basic technology? All of these things. Your vision statement. It should clear the one thing I want to point out here mostly, it should clarify number three, it should clarify your purpose and your direction. Mostly your direction. Where is your company going? Also, vision statements tend to get really loosey-goosey, so they should be well understood. And I'm gonna, I can't wait to give you examples until you can see. Your company's value statement. What is your view of the world? Is it unchanging? Is it gonna be the same now in the as it is in the future? What do you expect out of people? All these things. Now, forgive me while I make sure I have these correct and they match my notes. When I started school 13 years ago for my undergrad, it used to be not be uncommon to go to a website and be like, what's your mission statement? Because everybody posts their mission statement and vision statement and they'd be massive. They'd be like these like big page long things. Uh, now, I think like we can all agree for the most part, we've all shifted to a society of like immediate, quick and short, right? Is that fair? Like very fast, seven second videos, whatever. Uh, now mission statements tend to be like really brief or they have like brief ones and then they have like an expanded version of it. But you get these like really, really brief missions and value statements. So we'll start with an easy one. I'm gonna give you a mission and value statement and then somebody try to guess what they are. The mission statement is to bring the best personal computing products and support to students, educators, designers, scientists, engineers, business persons, and consumers in 140 countries around the world. And the vision statement is to make the best products on earth and to leave the world better than we found it. No, it is not. It is Apple, right? Low hanging fruit. No pun intended. That should be an easy one. This one's not too bad. I want to make sure again. Yeah, I have notes on it. And then I went through and uh, double checked a lot of them. And I think some of them have changed recently. I want to do my favorite one at least. Okay, mission statement. Very simple, very short. Our mission is to give everyone a voice and show them the world. We believe that everyone deserves to have a voice and that the world is a better place when we listen, share, and build a community through stories. This is my favorite one. Uh, it is YouTube. How'd you know that? You just said that last time. I did? Yeah. No! <laughs> Yeah, I think they're funny because they got in trouble for all the uh, like silencing voices thing. And then like their whole mission statement and vision statement is all based around this like, we're going to give everybody a voice. So yeah, they get bashed for that one a lot. I would have known if it makes sense. It doesn't make sense, does it? I'm not going to go through the others because I don't have them readily available. But the point being I like to make on that is if you look at the company's missions and vision statement, they they almost have become, this is all opinion. So this is like, everybody make this is like, my professor just has an opinion, this is in fact. Uh, they've almost become more like signaling a lot of times and they like sound good for shareholders and they're quick to like digest, right? Cause like 
do those mission statements make any sense? I mean, like Starbucks is about like supporting the world one cup, one handshake, one whatever at a time. Like it's it's very like friendly. Uh, whereas mission statements used to be very direct. Like we're here to do this. This is what the world needs. This is what we're providing. You know, like Ford's used to be all about like we need to help the economy and everybody moving by allowing people to transfer, you know, have easy transportation and accessibility and all of this. Like, oh, you're like, oh, it makes sense. You make vehicles, you make them cheap, you make it easy for everybody to get a hold of. Fantastic. But not so much anymore. So then we can assess the current reality. Now, there are a lot of ways to do this. In my st uh, strategy class, we learn about uh, assessing internal and external environments. And when we do this, we learn about all these different tools and ways to do it. It's kind of funny because like when you're in school, when I was in like my master's and stuff, we would do like SWOT analysis and orders by forces and a bureau analysis and a balance check sheet. And like, these are all like different ways to evaluate things. And you would like sit in class, look at a company and like fill out a chart and be like, nobody actually does this. Then happily, I actually realized that companies do this all the time. It's like very common. If you become any sort of consultant, that's like one of the first thing you do is use these tools to like analyze a company and then you can take this uh, analysis and then decide what the company should do and so that is the whole purpose of assessing the current reality you only really have control over your actual organization which is your internal environment now this is a scary fun fact for everybody it's not in the book you should all listen it's very freaky uh you can control your internal environment but the external environment exists. Now, what I mean by that is like your suppliers, demand, COVID existing, uh, you know, foreign policy, everything, you know, economy's changing, all sorts of things changing, right? Competitors appearing that you don't expect, all these things. So in a way, uh, a very common analysis is to think of like a ship at sea. So it's like you're a ship, you're at sea, your ship is your organization. You can adjust your sails and you can plan ahead to avoid storms and rough water. You can do that but you have limited control over what's actually happening around you. Very limited. If you are in a storm, if the storm just appears, all you can do is adjust your boat, but it still may sink. Internally, we have lots of research that shows organizations' actual internal environment accounts for about 40% of the profitability, which is awesome. Almost half of your profitability is from internal decisions. However, the external environment can affect 20 to 60% of your profitability, meaning you can lose 60% of your profitability if you were just in a really shitty situation, like very unlucky. There are companies that were developing since 2018, 19, that were making all the right choices and then COVID exists and they're gone and there is nothing they could have really done about it. That's the general consensus. You are done and you have no control, right? You are a uh, TikTok. I told you the whole ByteDance story. TikTok exists, ByteDance creates them, their government, China, and the United States get into it. TikTok hit it off in America. That seems fine because everybody sells apps to America. That's great to have an American audience. We have lots of free time. We like entertainment. We spend lots of money on these things. This is great. Advertisements work really well on Americans. This is fantastic. Uh, and then all of a sudden your two governments get into war and your China's government's like, we will destroy you if you sell to come to the United States. And it's like, well, what are we going to do here? We had no control over these politics that were going on. Usually I have more time in my strategy class and then I have to say, but your decisions matter, make good choices. Um, but you go to organizations and there are a lot of things out of your control. So a common spread or a step to take is a SWOT analysis. Have you all used a SWOT before? It's probably like the most common, straightforward tool of analysis. So, yes, some people yes, some people said no. In my marketing class. In your marketing? Yeah, it's very common in marketing. So what you do with a SWOT analysis? Because in this class, we have to focus on both internal and external quickly. We're not going to go super deep dive. Okay. If you're looking at your organization's internal strengths and weaknesses, what does our company do well? What do we have that other people don't have? What can we leverage? And what weaknesses do we need to avoid? There is a misconception we teach about it in strategy a lot that you should always play to your strengths, which is true. 
And then this idea that you should always improve your weaknesses, that is not necessarily true. Sometimes you should, sometimes the name of the game is avoid your weaknesses, right? Don't do things you don't do well. There's a couple of companies out there that don't advertise very well, or, you know, if you think about, um, I mean, there's some laws governing this, but like vaping and tobacco companies, a lot of this are very successful and they can't advertise, but they like also, they, they can't in some ways, but they're very limited in how they can do it, right? But that's not really the name of the game for them because they're not very popular, but they still get sold a lot. So they just avoid that weakness of like people not liking them by just shutting up. They're just dead silent. They just sell. They do great. Then you look at external opportunities. So the future's changing. You're gonna have different opportunities for growth. The idea is if you're not growing, you're dying. Uh, you should always be recording quarterly growth. Otherwise, it's not good to stagnate. So you look for future opportunities and you also look for the external threats around you. Just like looking for the storm that could potentially be coming. You can't stop the storm, but you need to see that it's coming and find a way to avoid it or at least mitigate it the best you can. This is the one the book got, gives. You can find a billion of these online, literally, if this one doesn't make enough sense. I think this one's a little wordy, but I have it. My plan is to one day create a slide deck that's so thorough, no one has to read the book. That would be great. And McGraw-Hill would not like it. But we use their connect, so. So here's a SWOT analysis, generally, just a general SWOT analysis of a college campus. So the strengths of a college campus, typically depending on the college campus, um, because OSU is actually very research focused, so this makes sense here. Uh, your faculty's teaching and researching abilities Universities make a lot of money through tuition. We also make a ton of money through research. Professors are actually typically paid for the research, not their teaching. Um, but some of us really enjoy it. If you're, a good if you're a good university, you usually have loyal alumni, people that go on to be successful, that give back. I mean, Boone Pickens pretty much entirely changed this uh, university himself. A weakness, some college campuses may have, uh, if you're a professor there, you may have high teaching loads, uh, which means you're teaching a lot, which means it makes it difficult to give every student the attention they need, also makes it difficult to produce research. A lot of campuses right now are suffering from insufficient racial diversity, so they get backlash from that. Opportunities. The general consensus now is we're missing skilled labor. We're also missing very specific skilled labor in certain industries. Uh, so universities have the opportunity to provide these and then get more students and then provide more successful people, which creates more loyal alumni, which creates more money, which is good for everybody. And then threats, obviously, if the state economy or local economy goes up and down, people can't always afford to go to school. Uh, you lose money if the government provides. OSU is public, meaning that the state gives OSU money. That's why everybody's salary is available online. If you didn't know, you can Google it. Who's the highest paid employee at OSU? Someone's got to know this. You can Google it. All everybody's salary is on there. It's this person by like an insane amount too, like a hundred times. Not a hundred. It's Mike Gundy. Yeah. He's an OSU employee. His salary has to be posted. That's why you know what college football, uh, coaches make because they're public except for usc and some private ones like lincoln riley left ou and went to usc they don't have to disclose his because they're private they don't take state money now for attendance today we are going to briefly I don't, are, is like this is all happening right in the dissertation so i don't have time to like really research this company like i used to is Facebook technically just meta now? Is that like the name of the company, right? Because the company was Facebook, correct? Yeah. It's Facebook, they owned Instagram and all those other things. They are now meta. I put this up here. I don't want to be like an idiot. So I'm be like, well, no, technically meta is a whatever name or something. So 
if you get on Canvas, and now someone verify this because I, I had to publish and republish, unpublish and republish last, or to get it to show up a second ago. So make sure there should be attendance for the uh, 21422 where you can just go in there and fill out. I chose Facebook because I think it's a company most people know whether you use it or not. So what I want you to do, you don't need to do a detailed SWOT analysis. This is very surface level, but please provide what is a strength of meta slash Facebook, um, at least one, one or two. What is a weakness? What is an opportunity? And what is a threat? Let's say one, just one of each. If you don't have a uh, laptop, of course, you can write it down and then just hand it to me at the end of the class. That works too. But everybody take about five minutes, do a very basic SWOT analysis. On the exam, you're not going to have to do a SWOT analysis, but you will have to be able to read something and be like, is this a strength, a weakness, opportunity, or a threat? So this just helps you understand it. So take about five minutes, do this, and then we'll reconvene. Let's take like one more minute.
as long as you have something feasible, even if it's wrong, as long as it is a strength or weakness, even if Facebook doesn't actually have it, we're not doing like a deep dive into Facebook's real core strengths here. Just one for each would be fantastic. All right, so I will do a quick SWOT analysis after we kind of have an open discussion um, as well. But real quick, someone give me a strength of meta. I hate saying meta. Doesn't it just sound, I don't know, bad, stupid, yeah. So Mark Zuckerberg, talk about like one of the world's like most hated CEOs that also pilots one of the most successful companies. That makes no sense, but anyway. <laughs> What is the strength of Facebook? Strong brand? Yes, definitely. Yes, big user base. Uh, we'd say, yeah, they have a strong control of the market right now. Like they could lose a lot of people and still make a lot of money. Yeah. It's actually spot on. Did you look it up? Yeah. I was like, yeah. I was like, okay, yeah. I was like, I know it was 2.5 two years ago and they've only increased really, so. Uh, despite what people think, Facebook's like hanging in there. Anybody else? Strengths is really the easy one. Like, oh, why are they selling it? Like that. A ton of cash. Yes. They're similar. Like Apple for a long time only kept their money in the bank. They had like fifteen billion dollars in the bank because they didn't want to reinvest it. A lot of people didn't like that. Um, a lot of people don't like when organizations hold cash because it's not in the economy flowing. They're just taking money out. Uh, but it keeps the, com the company safe. Um, but yeah, they do hold a lot of cash. All right, what about a weakness of Facebook? Ah, yeah, bad, bad positioning. It's funny as I feel like they almost backed off of it. They made it like a big deal and then it got memed immediately and they were like, okay, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> a publisher? Thank you for knowing the details of that. That is a, yeah, that one's hard. I'm going to talk about that in a second. The weakness is... They kind of have this weird lack of control slash control thing right now. Anything else? Yes, uh, privacy concerns, their security. It's funny, they, they actually have, technically speaking, really good security. It's just they have so much risk that it's not good enough. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, so they get, they get busted. Yeah, you're exactly right. The privacy concerns, which we'll talk about also. Now, what... Um, about some potential opportunities that Facebook has or Meta. I refuse. Facebook has. <laughs> so external future growth opportunities, anything happening? They tried to get TikTok at one point. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, man, I'm just it would have been disgusting. Yeah, yeah they control TikTok. Um, they also, they have like one really big competitor that does something niche that they don't. As far as social media goes, like Twitter. They don't own Twitter and they don't own Snapchat, I believe, which has like a very unique hold. Um, but they do have opportunities. Uh, there's been a lot of talk for years that eventually those companies might come together. Um, which wouldn't be shocking. I mean, can you imagine what Twitter could do with like Facebook's resources and vice versa and the way they could cross over advertisements and control would be so much easier. Uh, it's really beneficial if they do that. Uh, there's obviously backlash as well, but otherwise they would have done it. But yes, if they, Twitter does something unique, uh, very niche, but if they control Twitter, which is a potential opportunity, it's not out of the realm by any means. If anybody's going to acquire Twitter, it's our <laughs> Twitter, uh, it's uh, Facebook. Now, what about threats? I cannot take the table. It's the competition. We just talked about Twitter, all them, Snapchat. Yeah, go ahead. 
everywhere. Have you ever in the history of organizations seen a company that can make both sides of the political orange or aisle angry at the same time for the same reason, but for different reasons? It's weird. They did it successfully, though. And then it's funny because people go to Facebook to complain about it. So, <laughs> anything else? Uh, the metaverse is not widely adopted. Billions of them spending results and zero net value and kind of distract their, their focus from their core. Product. Yes. Uh, so, you could say a threat could be everything that they've invested failing in the future because it doesn't seem like the market might go that way. So, it could be if you're doing a real spot analysis, like writing it out, it would probably be. The market shifting away from their strategy, like what they're investing towards. So, quick overview of Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. This is as over 2000, uh, 2021 by B Strategy Hub. I took a lot of the stuff from B Strategy Hub because they did a very detailed SWOT analysis that I added to it. Uh, originally, I had slides that broke it all down, but I'm just going to do it verbally because I wasn't going to give it to you anyway. Uh, founded in February 4th. No, you can look it up. You don't need it for the exam. It's just an example. Uh, February 4th, 2004. So they just celebrated their anniversary. Um, as of 2020, they had 44,000, roughly 45,000 employees. I think that's still gone up despite COVID. Uh, they're public, so you can. they're publicly traded. Their uh, tag is FB, if you didn't know. And their annual revenue is around $73 billion. Uh, 21 billion net income. A lot of money. Now, you all actually covered pretty good a lot of their strengths. Uh, the number one strength most people actually consider, uh, B Strategy Hub, when they did a detailed analysis of them, said their number one strength was their brand. They're rated fifth most recognizable and powerful brand in the world. So, very recognizable, which is weird that then you would switch to meta, but whatever. I actually, I understand the change because in my mind, Facebook was Facebook, the website, and the fact, despite the fact they owned everything else. Their brand itself is valued at around $88 billion. They also have a really diversified portfolio, believe it or not. They own things like Oculus, which is virtual reality, right? And they have Facebook and Instagram and a lot of things that, again, build off each other. Um, so their strategies make sense, like owning Instagram, owning Facebook, and then you can take things on Instagram and post them on Facebook. And the way they competed with TikTok for a while was, uh, they still do it now. Uh, me and my wife don't use TikTok, but my daughter always thinks we're on TikTok because she sits on Facebook and goes through the short videos, which are a rip from TikTok, and their Instagram videos that are posted on there. So they, they pull everything together. And then, then they also, acquire, like I said, virtual reality with Oculus. They also own Portal, which is video calling service. Uh, they have a product called Workplace, which is like a business tool. Uh, they do a few things that a lot of people may not know about, um, but they're like different products and things that you only know about if you have to use them. They're also very market dominant. Uh, for social media networks, they have, like you said, a right around 2.9 billion monthly users, which is how you typically measure social media, whatever their monthly users are. Second is YouTube at right around 2 to 2.5 billion. So that's no, it's nothing to scoff at. They're quite a bit higher than YouTube. Mostly because YouTube offers one thing and Facebook offers lots of things. And in a way, also YouTube. Number three is WhatsApp, if you didn't know. And then also number four is actually Messenger, which is also owned by Facebook. Another strength they have is they are very good at uh, R&D. They have lots of rapid development, and also they are very good at advertisements. They're really good at advertisements. That's where they make most of their money. It's how they add to you. Isn't it spooky when you're talking about something and you get on there and it's like, bam, I have gotten so much snow gear stuff because Jael's going to Colorado and she bought plane tickets and all of a sudden, boom, Facebook flooded with that, right? Uh, with kids and stuff, we have a friend who's about to have a child and we talk about it all the time and bought them gifts and now boom, baby stuff. Looks like Jai and I are having kids. Oh yeah, yeah, they, they, they take data. Which brings us to our weaknesses. Um, they did a survey. Now, I'm gonna complain for a second. Uh, when you see places like The Verge, or like a lot of news networks and stuff do surveys. 
they do a lot of things that we consider like not best practice. Uh, as in, it's like not a good way to survey people. And this survey, like the best survey we have of it does this. So what it is, is they ask people who aren't on Facebook, why aren't you using Facebook? And you know what the number one reason was? Overwhelmingly, 46%, half of the people they asked said this. No, great, great one though. But it, it actually ties into that. Privacy concerns, they're stealing my stuff, they're stealing my data, they're tracking me. Uh, the number two reason, which is why I say I don't like this, is they're not interested. Now, the reason that's a problem is when you do surveys like this, you are obviously not interested because you don't have Facebook. Not make that a choice. We are interested in why you are not interested. So don't put that as an option. Um, that's not good. So uh, it was privacy and trust information. Um, they don't like uh, Facebook business model, as in they, they don't like the company, right? And then like a lower reason was like my friends and family aren't using Facebook, stuff like that. 9% uh, though was advertising, like just, just plainly. They didn't like the ads. Now, they do have a massive dependence on advertising. So if anything ever happened to that, they would take a big hit. They make like almost $70 billion off ads, right? Um, or at least their net worth comes from that. Now, I will talk about why that is important here in a second uh, when we get to threats. But then also, uh, weaknesses and threats are going to be kind of close here. We're going to talk about what they don't do well and then future uh, potential litigations and policy changes that are going to harm them, which would be a threat. They have been accused, uh, you said they're a publisher, uh, they're getting hated on quite regularly now for censoring some people. So one side of the argument is like you're censoring people, which you can do as a private company. As a private organization, you can censor people all you want. Your First Amendment rights that aren't protected in a private organization. So they can censor people. Fantastic. However, if you censor people, you also are now responsible for what's on your site. Fully responsible. If I'm going to censor, if, I, if I'm going to prevent what's on my site, then now I'm responsible for what's displayed. Meaning if someone posts an illegal video and I don't take it down immediately, I can be sued by the company that posted the video because I'm responsible. If someone says something, like right now, it's like COVID misinformation. If someone says something that's COVID misinformation and someone can determine that that costs lies or whatever, I can be sued for that because I'm responsible. Facebook right now is not responsible for that. However, they can censor. So the other argument is, if you're going to be censoring people, you have to be responsible. So you shouldn't be allowed to censor people if you are a publisher or a public forum. You have to be one or the other. You're either publishing content, which means you're a private organization, you're responsible for what you publish, or you're considered a town square or a public forum, which means you are not responsible for what's posted there, but people's rights are protected. So they can post what they want and you can't steal their information also. They need government funding. They do. That's because they're so, they're considered vital for like information exchange. It's a big argument that's been going on with YouTube and Facebook and it's going to end and I'm not arguing one side or the other. I'm saying that is what these people are saying is the problem. That is what these people are saying the problem. It's pointing to the same issue and it's causing problems. <laughs> uh, so they pissed off everybody in that way. So they don't right now, they've basically become so large and the law is so flimsy and they are trying to appease everyone that now their weakness is essentially lack of control. They don't have control over what they are, what they're supposed to do. Um, they're just kind of towing a line right now. Because of course, if they take a lot of stuff down, then people are like, you're censoring stuff you don't know. If they don't take it down, then it's like you're allowing this information to be spread and we think this is bad and whatever. So it's, it's become an issue. Oh, that's a loaded question as hell. Um, Yes. Yes, but they also lost a lot of lose our users at one point. I must said losers. They lost a lot of users. I use Facebook um, at one point uh, for people believing that there was too much like hate speech on there and stuff. And if you, it, it could become a wild west. It could become Reddit and you know 4chan if you guys know what that is and uh, all these things. Uh, so that could be bad because right now they are very public. Like everybody knows who they are. If they get into this, they only have to, you know, they can only block things like pornography and stuff like stuff that's illegal to post on there. 
um, that they couldn't take you down if you had a bad take on something, right? And then that could be pursued as hate speech or whatever. And then you've got all this backlash. And I mean, they're a billion dollar, the, the problem is that they're so big. So I mean, it's a, almost a good problem to have, but I don't know what the best outcome is. <laughs> like, I have friends that post stuff. And then like, I'll see a certain person that they like, Mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah I'm, I'm always like this there's so many people that believe strongly different ways so i don't get too much into it but everybody has an opinion on it for sure um four chan <laughs> don't go there it's four uh, chan's like uh i've been there a long time but it's like a very lawless board where you can like have you ever been to reddit oh, okay it's like you can go to different places on different subjects and people can post there kind of like Facebook. So it's like, oh, I want to talk about NFL football and they have like a whole football section. People can post whatever they want, but there's really no rules governing what's on there. So there's a lot of like horrible things on everywhere and that's how they exist, but that's what they do. We're not going to take anybody down. You can do whatever you want. So, and they're not as popular. Um, Cause you do segregate the market a lot when you allow anything on your side. The probably the best thing, if I could say what the best thing is for everybody in this room is for Facebook to have major competitors like an alternative to Facebook that does not censor or does censor or whatever, right? Uh, whatever it is, the, the alternative or the best outcome for everybody in this room is major competition. Generally. I'm sorry? Yeah, but at least they could choose what route they want to go. Yeah, they could be very definite into one and then they can be definite into one and then users can go what they want and then us in this room can have multiple choices and go where we want to go. But right now, Facebook dominates and, you know, What's up? Yeah, I don't, I, I know what you're talking about. I knew this more when I was teaching my ethics class because we do a whole uh, chapter on it, but I don't remember right now. But yeah, they're, they're up in the air. Are they a publisher or not? And that decision is going to affect everybody. And yeah. I don't have a strong take on one way or the other. I'm just telling you what's happening. Uh, but yeah, Facebook has to deal with that. They've become very large. They're continuing to get large and uh, they pissed off a lot of people that there's not a ton of alternatives to them right now. Uh, and uh, people are trying to become an alternative to them, but it's just difficult. Now we're gonna go briefly because I know it's almost time to go. Uh, opportunities, they can continue to expand. They have lots of hands in different places. Uh, there's been talk about them expanding their marketplace to become more of like an eBay type thing. They could definitely do that because they have a marketplace that does pretty well. They've talked about going into the dating sphere uh, to compete with a lot of other companies because they have a massive user base. It would be very easy to do already. Uh, so they have lots of opportunities to continue to expand different directions. Also acquiring Oculus, they have a chance to go more into like gaming and stuff, which obviously fits with their whole, uh, with their bill and they can advertise really well. Um, I'm going to jump real quick to threats because we've already talked about most of their threats, but a couple of them, I think are interesting. It's one competition. You never know what Amazon's going to do or Google or Twitter. They're all very powerful and have similar abilities, right? They can expand in areas that they approach on Facebook. But also when we are talking about advertisements, they have to be careful because they make so much money through ads and users are wicked smart and hate ads. And uh, if you've noticed, advertisements have had to adapt over the years. You used to have really, really long football commercials. And you watch football, have these long commercials, and it's like, now everybody is walking to the kitchen and going to the bathroom and ignoring these. So now you've got things in-game or sponsored, or while the game's going on, they put the ad in the bottom hand, like the bottom corner, whatever they can do. Uh, my favorite thing that's happening right now, do you guys know what Brave Browser is? Yeah, Brave. So I use Brave. What Brave Browser does, the way they make their money, is when you go to a, a site, you get a bunch of ads, right, that are put on there. Now that takes time to load the ads. So you just, you load the page, but you also load all the ads. What Brave does is they go out and people pay them to put ads on their browser and they replace the ads on the website with their ads. But that makes it load instantly because their ads are preloaded. So it's like your, your website gets faster. And Facebook tried to block them for a long time because basically you go to Facebook and whatever ads who's paid Facebook for don't exist because they would just put theirs over it. And the ads are not tailored because Brave refused, like says they don't take your data. So the ads aren't tailored to you. They're general ads. 
Um, now that obviously completely kills Facebook because they can't tailor ads to you. They're not making their ad revenue. Uh, so they've tried to block Brave. I think they did for a while and that was a workaround and it works fine. I've never been blocked on Facebook using Brave. Also, they have a problem with fake accounts on Facebook that they try to stop. That's a problem because if you have, you can't tailor ads to this person if it's fake, you also have people getting on there and uh, you know posting a million times about whatever and making the user experience worse. They try to stop fake accounts. To be honest, that'll never happen. I have like six accounts. Like it's very easy to do. Like you can get fake email addresses, fake phone numbers, fake anything. It's so simple. Sometimes they ask for like a license and you can just upload a picture of anything at all and it'll just let you through. Like they just are trying to create false barriers. Um, so, and they have some real barriers, but I know we're at time. You just gotta run this long. Uh, so, thank you so much. We have chapter six stuff due Sunday. And Wednesday, we'll finish chapter six. Thanks for the Facebook talk. But they are meta, right? Like, they are the company meta. Yeah. Do you know if their stock ticker change? Is it still FB? It's still the same. Really? OK. Facebook's still still Facebook. <laughs> OK, I'm just interested. But I think with the SEC, they make a lot Yeah, I don't know. I so difficult to rebrand like that. Thank you so much. Oh yes, you do have these. Have you did pull it in line, please. So I was wondering if there's like a better way to suggest that. Like, is it like going through those? Um, I mean, that helps for sure. Um, do you mind? I can definitely give you a more detailed answer when I can like sit down and think and you can kind of discuss with me how you do. Do you want to do like email or do a Zoom call or whatever you want? I'll give you an email. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. That works perfectly. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. So I was trying to actually use the are you talking about the connect quizzes? Yeah. We do not have the like so when I did connect, it pulls everything from connect over. But since we're not grading connect for quizzes here, they were essentially shut off. I guess they did that. Um, if you want access to them, I think I can go in there and set false dates on them and set them at zero points, which you can still access the quizzes. Well, I can access it, um, and I went through that first one, mm -hmm. but it uh, since it's zero points, it just shows up as 100, and you can't actually see any of the questions after okay. you submit it. So yeah, so we used to do the quizzes and not the Uber case, and then we switched it this year. And I think the quizzes is kind of weird. I can go in there and set it if you want to be able to see all the questions. Would that be better? Well, that was the only thing I wanted to be able to do, so I could like see if I got it wrong or right. Oh, OK. Yeah. I mean, I can go in there and set it so everybody is active. The only problem is it makes the grade books start getting weird, because you guys are going to have a billion quizzes that say out of zero points. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, if you if you don't care, if people don't care, I don't care. I'll get out of your way, sir. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Right. Went um, long today.